Pencil. <laughs> is from Diane, who says, Every year I let my teenage son go with friends to a Halloween event at a local theme park. I just learned that they have a haunted house based on Satan and demons. Apparently there are girls in suggested demon outfits selling drinks, techno music, and even a demon DJ who encourages people to dance. The devil wants to destroy you. He's out to kill you. He's going to put everything nice in your way. He's going to see my father's pleasure and sin for us. It's Halloween has become a night.
Jay Yo from the Haunted Kingdom of Ohio. I am Ryan Peverly, your Halloween party host, and you are listening to Occulture's presentation of Trap or Treat 2. This has been a month-long thematic series that has led up to this point, Halloween, the creepiest time of the year, and we're getting our creep on yet again with our guest, Seth Breedlove. Seth is the filmmaker behind Small Town Monsters, an independent film series that explores lost and bizarre history around the United States. Seth's films focus on small town folklore and tell stories through the words and experiences of the residents and witnesses who were most affected by these stories. Seth's previous films under the Small Town Monsters banner include 2015's Minerva Monster, 2016's Beast of Whitehall, 2016's Boggy Creek Monster, 2017's The Mothman of Point Pleasant, and his latest film, Invasion on Chestnut Ridge, which lays the foundation for our discussion here. I do want to point out that it seemed I had a loose microphone cord, so my audio is a little different sounding than usual. I think it's alright, but just wanted to point that out. So enough prologue, let's flip this script to dialogue and roll the reel on this creep show. Enjoy! (laughs) <laughs> hey seth how are you man good how are you doing well doing well thanks for being here i don't know if i mentioned this on facebook but i'm born and raised in ohio just like you it's cool to talk to somebody who has at least in the the indie paranormal documentary filmmaking community has kind of put ohio back on the map let's just start there ohio does have its uh, fair share of paranormal folklore but for people unfamiliar mm-hmm. with the state you know our native land here is there anything in particular about ohio that makes it such an interesting paranormal location or is it just as paranormal as any place else i think um yeah, I don't know. It it could be the history, and the, the Ohio definitely has a very like weird atmosphere in some spots, and and I think the geography plays a part in it as well because of like the the way the state's laid out with you know like the the south the southern part of the state especially is very much like like the foothills of the Appalachians and all that, but then you you go to the the upper part with like the northern part of the state, especially the west northwest part of the state, and it's very like Illinois or something. You know, I live in Medina County, which is I consider it the 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 point in Ohio where it becomes Midwest. Like everything east and south of where I am right now is a lot like Pennsylvania. And then you move into this area where I live, which is Medina County, and it becomes very much like, you know, flat farmland and all that kind of stuff. And the further west you go, the more flat and kind of dull it gets. So it could be that, but it's like, there's a long, like, there's a lot of like really famous swamps in Ohio too, which I've discovered since moving up to this area, which I never knew about. Like I found out about the Great Black Swamp, which was this huge swamp in the the northwestern part of the state that stretched all the way into Indiana. And then where I am now, there's a little tiny town called River Sticks right near where I live, which in itself is weird because River <laughs> yeah. Sticks obviously is like, you know, the 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 Greek uh it I think it's Greek mythology. It might be Roman. I think it's Greek. Where you're ferried over, you know, by death to to the other side over the river Styx. So in itself, that's bizarre. But apparently, they named it that because of the swamps in that area were so impenetrable that if you went in, you you basically were guaranteeing your death. So they named this tiny village that was built on former swampland, River Styx, which I think is funny. But there's a lot of little towns like that here. So and then like. Just a little south of me is Canal Fulton, which is this canal town along the Erie Canal. Something weird, I'm going off on tangents here, but something weird I've just discovered about the Erie Canal is how many, so the, so the Erie Canal starts in New York and then comes all the way to, and I think it actually starts near New York City, but it comes all the way, you know, to, toward where we are in Ohio. And it, it runs through a lot of like very paranoid, like areas that have a lot of paranormal activity. So it's, you know, it, it runs n- right near Minerva, where the Minerva monster is, but it goes out near Whitehall, New York, which is also super weird and bizarre. Um, yeah, so that's, that's an interesting correlation. Know. Yeah, because you've it, those are their, your first two films. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's so I don't know. I, I don't have basically what I'm saying is I don't have an answer for you, but I definitely 
think that the state itself has has a, a, a larger than normal share of l- local legends, you know, like, and, and every state has them, but Ohio has maybe more than some other states I've been to. I just know that within a, if I want to go in a 10 mile radius of my house right now, I can take you to like 20 different locations with their little like urban legends or folk tales. You know, we have rogues hollow is right near where I am, which is this ghost infested place where supposedly like uh, it was a hideout for outlaws. And then there's canal Fulton has the canal man, but it also has two or three crybaby bridges. If, If you go a little further North, there's a, a gateway to hell there's a haunted cemetery in River Sticks, and then obviously River Sticks is home of the River Sticks monster, which is one of my favorite like local Bigfoot stories. So there's, I don't know, it just seems like Ohio has a lot of that stuff going on. And there's, I'm gonna get to delve into it, I think next year a little bit more specifically the the Bigfoot side of things when we when we start making a project I haven't announced yet. <laughs> Man, I and I do love a good gateway to hell story. I I, I don't know mm-hmm. which one you're referring to, but I've I've heard plenty of those around. So, and I I do want to tell you, I grew up in the Black Swamp area. That's where I'm from. Oh, awesome! Yeah, yeah. So up, up in that what what town? The town's called Hicksville. It's in nice. Defiance. Yeah, it's in Defiance County, uh, about 20 minutes across the state line from Fort Wayne, Indiana. I I don't know of any Black Swamp monster legends or anything. I'm sorry. I don't know if you've heard any, but I grew up there and I just, I never heard anything about that. The only thing I can tell you about Black Swamp is, is is as far as like local legends, I don't know of any, I'm sure there's a lot of towns up there that have their own little monster legends, but going back to the time when the swamp was still actually there, the only thing I can tell you is that up in that part of the state, after it was drained, there were a number of Bigfoot type creature sightings that took place in the 19 like 30s up in in that part of the state which makes sense if you're of the you know if you consider the creature real or whatever and you're trying to figure out where they would be it makes sense that they'd be in this part of the state where you know that formerly there was a massive swamp where no one else came and then all of a sudden the swamp's gone and they're still hiding out in that area or something like that but there was there there were a lot of a lot of bigfoot stories up there that's cool, man. Like I said, I never heard any, but that doesn't mean that there aren't any. I was curious too. Have you heard of Helltown, Ohio? That legend up, I think it's near you. So yeah, it's, I think it's been grossly exaggerated as most of these stories are, but yeah, that's one of my, that's one of the places I go hiking all the time. It's actually, it's, it's, it's right near Peninsula, Ohio, but Helltown could technically be considered almost all of Cuyahoga Valley National Park because of the fact that when they're referring to Helltown, I believe they're they're referring to this like it must be eastern part of the town of Pen- the village of Peninsula, which is in the smack dab in the middle of Cuyahoga Valley National Park. But what happened is like the the government bought out all these houses and then kicked people out of their homes, and in some cases like torched the house while people were still leaving, and you know all kinds of crazy stuff. But I have heard of it, and I've gone hiking in there. It's there's a strange vibe to CVNP. I've talked about it. I used to talk about it all the time on my Sasquatch podcast. But there, there's just there's a lot of activity up in that area. Not so much like ghostly stuff, but a lot of like cryptid reports from like you know they had the Peninsula Python, which was this giant snake that lived in Cuyahoga Valley, which was and, and my buddy Mark Maskey and I have talked about it a lot. The the cool thing about the Peninsula Python is it's like a recorded documented story from from newspaper reports and like people seeing this thing it's if you go to the local peninsula library there's actually a giant mural of the um peninsula python what they've done is they've taken this the mural is real narrow it's it's not very wide it's probably like two feet wide but it stretches all the way to the ceiling of the library and it um on it, it's like it's the body of the python, and then along the body, they've stitched like um, newspaper articles and sketches and pictures of the mob that's going out to hunt the python and all that kind of stuff. But then the other thing about CBNP is that it's in the state of Ohio. It's got more Rick, uh, BFRO Bigfoot uh, sighting reports than any any other place, which might just be that they haven't documented them. I don't know how that works because I don't really care about the BFRO that much, but like. 
not not to insult. Oh my god, I'm already going to be on someone's bad side. Uh, <laughs> but the, the the I'm just saying, like in in within the CB Cuyahoga Valley National Park, there's there's a boatload of Bigfoot sighting reports and just general weird activity. I've never been in there, but I, I've heard of Helltown and the stories around that that area for years. Apparently, there was I mean, like aside from the hauntings, was it a, a hotbed for satanic cults or something as well? I've heard all of that. I don't buy any of it. <laughs> I think, you know, if, if if you look at Helt, like I said, like, I don't think there's actually a section of the park where there's like a, an abandoned town. It's, it's the fact that you can go anywhere within the park and come across these abandoned houses. It is pretty creepy. And I'm sure at some point there, there has been like say satanic activity or like you know, the cults or something meeting in there. That wouldn't surprise me at all. I think you're in much more danger of running into, um, again, I'm probably going to get in trouble, but like you could, you stand a much better chance of bumping into like a drug dealer because there's, there's been, there's about one or two missing persons reports that happen within CVNP each year. And I think a lot of it's related to drug activity, but it is strange. Like I was hiking in there off of, uh, I forget the trail I was on. It might've been it might have been Oak Hollow or Oak Oak Hill Road, which is where I usually go to hike. I got off on one of the trails up there, and I was walking through the woods, and I saw something red, like through this pine forest off to my right, and I couldn't figure out what I was seeing, so I hiked back off the trail, and I came into this clearing, and there's just an abandoned barn, you know, an old well, and and like this crumbled down house, and that's totally normal for for CVNP, you know, like I guess what happened is the government when it was turned into a, a, a national, it wasn't always a national park. In fact, it wasn't a national park. I want to say till like the late nineties or early two thousands before that it was a recreation area. And when the state started buying, or their, I guess the government started buying up those houses, what they would do is they would, they would literally run people out of their homes. They would buy the house off of them. But as soon as it was all taken care of, they'd run them out of their homes in some cases, torching the house while they were still moving their, their stuff out of the property. So you, you have, abandoned homes in there where they never got rid of them where they never actually tore the house down and stuff. So when they say hell town, I think it's, it's kind of a misnomer because I think it's, it's not that there's like one specific place where all these abandoned buildings are. I think they're just spread all over the park. So it's like, that's what I mean when I, I really get the impression that it's more of a, that is like your, your perfect urban legend where I, I think it's taking somewhat of a truth and turning into something completely different never actually talked to anyone who claimed any sort of supernatural activity within that area, like ghost activity or anything like that. That's not to say it's not there. I'm sure it is, but I've never actually talked to anyone. Right, right. So last question about that. Is there any missing persons cases that come out of there? Because you see a lot of that in national parks. Yeah, we get one or two a year. And there's been some weird... The thing about CVNP that's very odd, I don't know. Have you been to the, to the actual park, like any part of the park? No, no, I haven't. Okay, it's it's strange because it's like sandwiched in between the two two of the biggest cities in Ohio. It's like it, the, the southernmost tip is in the middle of Akron and the northernmost runs all the way up into Cleveland. And it, it's weird because the northern part is like overseen by the Cleveland Metro Park system. And the southern part is overseen by Summit County's metro parks. But the middle part is where it's actually like, you know, a, a, what you would classify as a national park. But even then, it's unusual for like compared to most national parks because there's people living within the park. There's towns and villages all over the place. But I think because of that, there is a lot of like gang and drug activity that takes place in some sections of the park. So there, when I say there's usually one or two missing persons or, or, or unusual death that take, takes place in the park, it's usually like some shady, like someone gets murdered and their body gets dumped, which is something that happened on Oak Hill Road a few years ago. This girl was killed in Cleveland and dismembered, and they took her body down to pieces of her body down to Oak Hill and dumped it around the trail. And a jogger actually was out jogging the trail when she found part of the body. So it's not completely unusual for that kind of thing to happen. I think the most recent that I can recall is a couple years ago or about a year ago, a younger lady had gone missing. Uh, she was a photographer and they found her body in the Cuyahoga river. And they claimed she had, I believe they claimed she had 
either hung herself or fallen from the bridge trying to take a fuck. I can't remember the exact details of the case, but I, I remember thinking it was really strange because I've run into some things in the park that I don't want to talk about publicly that made me think there's some shady stuff going on in there. No, so like, uh, like maybe clandestine government operations. No, again, it's nothing that exciting. It's like shady possible pot grows <laughs> and oh, uh that's that's not tri- bad that's not bad. no trip wire and stuff like that you know like okay. i just i don't as far as like any any super shady like government stuff i've never seen any evidence of that although i did think it was really odd that they closed off there's a section of the oak hill trail that's been closed off for like two years for no apparent reason um and it's my favorite part of the trail so i still hike up there but that's been that that was kind of weird and and of course the first time i discovered that was like not too long after i had learned about david Pallady's missing 411 stuff so i was like this has to be some sort of government operation secret government operation but i don't know if it is for all i know it's you know could be that the trail was falling apart or something up there right well that's exactly why i asked you that question because of the missing 411 cases so yeah now before we get into invasion on chestnut ridge I do want to know, you know, since you grew up in Ohio, obviously we've been talking about it being a pretty paranormal place, but where did your interest in the paranormal come from? Did you have any experiences as a as a kid or, or was it just a a cultural interest, you know, via folklore or movies? Yeah, uh, it, that honestly is all it is. I, I I think I got into the paranormal because of the Mothman Prophecies movie. I saw it in theaters like six times. I was a giant fan and my sister bought Keel's Mothman Prophecies book. And I remember flipping through it and um, being surprised that, that there was a contingent of people out there who who thought that stuff like ghosts and UFOs and all that kind of, you know, the other unusual phenomena were real. Like, to me, that always seemed like something that was fiction, uh, just, just a fictional kind of, you know, a tenant of, of fiction. And... Um, Mothman Prophecies, the book, kind of made me, I guess, open open my eyes to the fact that some people consider that you know that that stuff to be an, a, a real you know UFOs to be real and all that kind of stuff. So that was where I first became aware of the paranormal as a subject. I didn't get into like Bigfoot or cryptids until much later. That would have been like probably two thousand seven, two thousand eight, before I got into that stuff. And it wasn't until probably 2012 before I started looking into it for myself. I, I think I've heard you say that you grew up Christian. Mm-hmm. Do you still follow those teachings? And how does that, seeing the world maybe through that lens, how does that affect your approach to paranormal topics like this? Yeah, no, I totally, yeah, I'm, I'm still still a Christian. The way, it, it really doesn't. Like yesterday I drove to, to West Virginia with my dad. And, um, you know, my dad's... My dad, obviously, is the one that raised me as a Christian, so he's he's in that same ballpark. But, um, you know, I mean, the whole, t- whole way we were talking about, like, the Flatwoods monster and everything, because we were interviewing, you know, Flatwoods witnesses. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't affect it in any way. I'm not closed off to anything because of it. Mark Maskey, who wrote Invasion on Chestnut Ridge, is a Lutheran minister, and he's the one that narrated the movie. And I, I think he's the one that told me there's the side of, of Christianity that everyone ignores is it actually encourages healthy you know a healthy curiosity and and if you are i think if you you are a christian like i am it, if anything it probably opened your eyes a little bit more to the unusual and the, and the paranormal as something that's that's probably real you know that there's an actual reality behind behind them other than yeah you, know, you know like whatever the typical skeptical arguments against the existence of this stuff i don't go i can tell you though where i differ from a lot of christians a lot of christians that i know of will look at a paranormal subject and immediately say satanic or like this is demonic or something. And I don't, I'm, I'm not that I've never been that way. I tend to, I tend to lean more toward, you know, it, when I, when I was looking at the Flatwoods monster, for instance, yesterday, I don't see any evidence of that being some sort of supernatural entity or like a supernatural case in any way or you know, my my demonic satanic radar didn't start going off when I when I looked into that, and it it usually doesn't. That's not exactly the what I jump to the conclusion I jump to immediately when I'm looking into paranormal subjects. I don't know. I feel like I'm rambling. That might have been a real rambling. <laughs> You're all right, man. 
I uh, yeah. I stumbled across a a quote from John Keel recently that I was talking about with somebody else the other day, mm-hmm. and he said that the more that he researched the paranormal, the more he felt that he was just researching demonology. Have you heard that quote? I have. Yeah, I've qu- I've said that to someone else. I told someone else that about that recently. I don't know. I, you know, I haven't been into this as long as Keel was. And I, I, not to say that I haven't looked at paranormal subjects and thought that, that sounds, you know, supernatural or, or demonic or however you want to, you know, phrase it. But for, for the most part, I, not for the most part, but for, for the cases that I've spent any length of time looking into, I haven't seen evidence of that. You know, the Mothman is the perfect example. I just don't see, I personally don't subscribe to the, to the demonic explanation for the existence of, of, you know, what, what those people experienced, not to say that I don't, I do occasionally wonder if sometimes different phenomena don't overlap, um, and create these, you know, these huge flaps of bizarre activity. Like in the case of the Mothman story, I've often wondered if it isn't like a bunch of different things happening simultaneously, um, a a bunch of like different explanations, you know, so maybe a misidentified owl, some sort of physical creature, you know, something, something spiritual or cult like, you know, going on stuff like that. But for the most part, when I look into these cases, I don't see, I don't see that as being a likely, you know, explanation. I think some of that has to do with the fact that, that my belief or or my knowledge of the way that, you know, like Satan or the devil operates doesn't necessarily mean that he's, overtly creating Mothman to take over the world or anything like that. Am I, the, the way I believe the devil would operate is much more subtle than something like that. You know? Yeah. The, uh, the greatest trick he ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Right. 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 Yeah. That's a great movie, by the way. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the usual suspects, right? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. You know, I mentioned Chestnut Ridge earlier. This is your new film, Invasion on Chestnut Ridge. This area, Seth, is it's home to some really bizarre paranormal activity. When did you first hear of the Chestnut Ridge folklore, and, and what made you want to tackle this story? I, I mentioned Mark Maskey a lot, so i got to give him credit again on this one. Mark's Mark was my co-writer on Invasion on Chestnut Ridge, and he was the narrator. But Mark and I did the Sasswat podcast for a few years together, and Mark still does the Sasswat podcast. But Mark was the one that really introduced me to Stan Gordon's work. I was familiar with Stan Gordon and his Silent Invasion book, though I hadn't read it because of like listening to interviews with him on other shows. But my knowledge of the the story beyond like kind of a tangential thing that I was vaguely aware of came through Mark Matsky and and his rabid fanboy adoration for this story. <laughs> so it's it all came via Mark. But it was weird too because like my my knowledge of the chestnut ridge was just basically rooted in the fact that there was a ufo bigfoot flap in the 70s i didn't really realize that that stan gordon's books more than anything are like case files you know they're cases he's investigated and that's all he's doing is kind of putting the information that he gathered out there for people to read so my because i'd never read the book in fact i didn't read the book until maybe a few weeks before we were you know working on the film so it all came through Mark, but uh, but the surprising thing on this one was how much I learned as we were working directly on the movie. You know, in a lot of the other cases that for films we made, it, I'm very aware. I do weeks of research, months of research, sometimes years of research leading up to the actual filming of the movie, and I go into it well versed in what's going on. And this one, I don't know that that's possible because of the way the filming went stan actually helped put me in touch with all of our witnesses and very early on i had asked him kind of solely to get me in touch with ufo bigfoot sighting witnesses and then uh witnesses of the kecksburg crash and instead stan sent me this list of like probably like 30 names and and it was across the you know i ran the gamut of things they'd experienced from you know bigfoots to unusual bird sightings black cats all kinds of stuff so as i was going over the witness list i was like 
it completely changed my my ideas about the movie. Instead of you know let's let's do this movie about Kecksburg and UFOs and Bigfoot, it became like let's man let's just do everything. Like let's get every single bit of you know the weird paranormal. Let's create like this paranormal stew, or I guess Lauren called it a paranormal cocktail. So that's how the movie kind of became what it is, which is cool because it, it actually is very similar to Stan's books because Stan's books are, are case files. And that's kind of what the movie became. Yeah, absolutely. There's a ton in there. There's a ton going on in the Chestnut Ridge area. Literally, I think any sort of paranormal phenomena that you'd be interested in, there's there's a piece of it for you there. Uh, could you tell people, though, that aren't familiar with the area or the stories what your movie focuses on, just give us a brief synopsis of what people would see if they watch it. Yeah, it's a, it's a invasion of Chestnut Ridge is basically a story about the Chestnut Ridge in Pennsylvania, which is the 72 mile uh, swath of land that starts in uh, near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and runs all the way south down into West Virginia. It rests right. It comes to rest like right above Morgantown, West Virginia. And so it's all about the, the the film kind of tracks the bizarre history of the Chestnut Ridge dating all the way back to the 1800s. And um, it starts with the Kecksburg UFO crash, which is obviously one of the most you know kind of famous UFO cases there are. And it ends with a Thunderbird uh, sighting that happened in, I think, 2015, 2000, I think it was 2015, 2012, something like that. And in between, we we have stops at the, the UFO Bigfoot flap of the 1970s, and we have stories about possible alien abductions and, and dogmen encounters and strange lights in the woods and all stops in between. The movie's really about the investigators in the area who've spent decades looking into this and how at the end of the day, it, it the entire thing kind of creates more questions than it does answers. So it was very different. Like for people that are familiar with our other films, I feel like it's different from our other films in a lot of ways. It's not about a central mystery, you know, like one central story or monster so much as it is this place. And I know early on when we were working on the, on the actual filming of the movie, Mark and I were talking and Mark said, well, you know, who, who's the main kind of monster. And I said, there's no, there isn't one. Like there isn't, I, we could have made it like Kecksburg is like the centerpiece. So the UFO Bigfoot flap is the centerpiece. But I, I decided the, what I thought of it was that the, uh, the place was actually the monster. So the, the central monster of the whole film is the, the chestnut Ridge itself. So yeah, that's an interesting that, idea. Yeah. And, and I love movies about, there's a lot of these stories, you know, in the paranormal world. And we, at the beginning of the film, we talk a little bit about, you know, like the, the Bermuda Triangle and that kind of stuff. And I wanted it to be that kind of story. My friend Aaron Kadju directed the um, Bridgewater Triangle movie, and that's kind of what that movie is. It's a movie about, you know, a place where strange things happen. But I wanted it to go a little beyond that and be as much about those people that actually look into this. Mark did a great job with the narration where he talks at the beginning of the movie about human curiosity. And the bookends for the film both kind of – it begins on that note and it ends on that note of like the people looking into this and how there's there, there probably aren't answers, uh, at least not in this life. And um, I, I really like that aspect of the movie. It adds a – it adds a little bit of weight to it because we had just come off of uh, the Mothman of Point Pleasant, which is kind of a heavy movie. It's it's got a completely different tone from this one, and this one was just going to kind of be our fun like Halloween scary story movie. But I think some of the stuff that some of the narration that Mark wrote really adds a a little bit of weight to it. And then obviously Barry Clark, his experiences and kind of the way they've affected his life added another element to that. Yeah, Barry was a, a pretty interesting guy to just sit there and watch and, and hear talk. He's got such a, a vast knowledge of the events that have transpired in the Chestnut Ridge area. But mm -hmm. you mentioned something, you know, how you focus on the people in this story. And you've been complimented for years about your approach to that, you know, taking that more humanistic approach to it. Why are you drawn to the people as opposed to the, the paranormal aspects, you know, because you really do focus on how these stories affect not only, you know, specific families, but also the community as a whole and their local culture. Why are you drawn to that so much? I, I think just because I grew up in a 
small town myself. And also before I ever did this filmmaking stuff, I was a, I was a writer and um, I focused on small business and what that really boiled down to was like focusing on people and their lives more so than their businesses. And um, that aspect of storytelling has always been what draws my, my favorite stories are rooted in people or characters more so than, you know, some crazy monster or whatever, you know, the story it's, it's always, always for me that everything revolves around the people that are at the center of it. And even like my favorite Bigfoot stories or crypto stories or paranormal, whatever, it's always about the people at the center of that for me, you know, like Jesse Marcel and, and the Caton family. And, you know, the, it boils down to the, to that much more so than, how scary the story is or whatever. And that stuff does play a part in it, but it's like the Flatwoods monster. I always wanted to be involved in the Flatwoods monster story because of the fact that I love the idea of the May family being the centerpiece for that story. And then, you know, the other kid, the stories about the other kids and, and the story about Ivan Sanderson and, and um, Gray Barker coming to investigate it and all that kind of stuff. I just, I always loved that aspect of the Flatwood story more than the monster itself or what the monster was. I mean, obviously the central mystery is really cool, but I'm drawn to the people. I think the more you do this, actually the more uh, powerful that draw becomes because you like yesterday we interviewed Eddie and Freddie May who were actually witnesses to the Flatwoods monster. I mean, are you familiar with the Flatwoods monster story? Yeah, just a bit. I, I don't know all okay. the details, but I've, I've done a little reading about it here and there. Yeah, it's 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 really cool. It's a it's a bizarre story. It's a one off, which I really like. You know, it happened one time and then that was kind of it. I mean, there were other sightings that ran around the same time, but we we actually got to interview Eddie and Freddie May who were who were there that night and they're both getting up there in years. They're in their late 70s. They they both survived three bouts with cancer, so they're, you know, it was kind of an honor just to be able to talk to them. And they both told me this is for Ed, it was his only interview to ever give about the Flatwoods monster. And for Freddie, he said, "This is it. I'm done after this one." And he was the—he's probably the third or fourth people person we've had tell us that. And you know, a lot of these stories are at risk of disappearing. And we had a—my dad and I actually had a discussion about this yesterday because the importance people put on a story about a monster sighting or a UFO sighting or whatever within a small town is minimal. If, if any, you know, they, they, it's usually laughed at or considered kind of a joke. It's kind of up to the people that are part of the, the, the subject, you know, the people that are into the paranormal to, to do their part, I guess, to document the story and, and, and preserve the history of it because, you know, these things will eventually disappear unless someone, you know, makes sure to be a caretaker of them. And even, even the people that are caretakers of these stories today could potentially see it disappear down the road. So I don't know. I, I think for me, all of it has always revolved around the people and hoping to, to play a part in preserving the story so it doesn't you know get lost to time or death or whatever, because that is definitely something we're going to run into. Yeah, absolutely, man. And I don't know about you, but the, the reason I like these kinds of stories so much is because they stimulate the imagination. And in a culture where we don't have a lot of that going on, these sorts oh, yeah. of stories do that. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's become my – I hate to say like the same stuff all the time in these – you know, when I talk to people because I'm afraid like someone that hears me on one show is going to be like, oh, he's just parroting the same thing he said on that show. But like I really I, – I do think that the world is really crappy right now. And stories like this, you know, like the like like the stories we've been documenting, I think there's something really appealing about the crypt, the the cryptids and the paranormal in general because of the fact that it's it's unexplainable, it's a mystery, and and it's fun to be a part of something. I think that the rest of the world might think doesn't exist. It almost you know gets your mind off the the awful nonsense going on within the real world, you know, politics and disasters and threats of nuclear war yeah it's pretty rough out there to be honest yeah let's do some storytelling then you know for people that are unfamiliar with some of these stories in the film you know we don't have to tell everybody every detail because it's such a, a well-made film that I, I would love to encourage people to, to go watch it obviously but mm -hmm. for people that don't know you know for example the kecksburg ufo crash uh december 1965 one of the most famous uh, ufo crashes in u.s history 
kind of like the Roswell of the East, I would say. Tell people a little bit about that story that's in the film. Yeah, yeah. The the Kecksburg UFO crash took place in 1965. This strange fireball was seen streaking across the sky. It crashed in a woods or a, a I guess not an actual forest, but a patch of, of trees surrounded by farmers fields off of a road out right outside of Kecksburg, Pennsylvania. And after after the crash happened, a number of people went to the general area to investigate it for themselves. And when they got there, they discovered military, uh, uh, military convoys, trucks and stuff coming into the mil- uh, into the wooded area. Later, they witnessed the trucks actually take something out of the wooded area on, on the back of one of the flatbed trucks uh, with a tarp over it. So that honestly is, is how that story boils down. But it, it's what's so fascinating to me about the Kecksburg crash is how it affected the town immediately afterward and then obviously in the decades to follow. Because the story kind of – it wasn't unknown, but it, it kind of didn't – bloom into something that that became a, a, a huge piece of ufo lore until like stan gordon got involved before that i don't think it was anywhere near as well known as it's become now but after that had happened there was all sorts of shady activity that happened there were uh, g- strange government agents that were in town around the same time people in the town that saw the convoy of trucks take these tar- the tarped object out of town were threatened by members of the government or military or whoever it was that was there that night. And there's other aspects of it we don't get into in our film that I really enjoy. But Stan has done his own documentary about it. And it's, you know, the the Kecksburg crash has been documented studiously by other ufologists. But there's there's a lot to that story that I really love. We're actually going to get to explore the Kecksburg crash a little bit more in depth in our Case Files YouTube series. When, when that launches, I actually interviewed one of the witnesses that isn't in the film. So that'll probably wind down the case files, YouTube series, like as a, as a two parter or something where we go a little bit more in depth on the crash. But yeah, there were, there were guys that were, there were actually guys in, in like NASA uniforms that went down into the ravine where the object had fallen, um, with like Geiger counters and you know, all kinds of strange stuff. The most common, explanation for what fell is that it was a meteor but it doesn't seem highly likely due to the fact that the if it was a meteor it it completely changed paths somewhere over lake erie and headed south down into into pa but yeah grace it's a great story it's been one of my favorites too for a long time i say that a lot though i think i've i've noticed i'm starting to say very often that this story is one of my favorites that story is one of my favorite they're they're all my baby (laughs) <laughs> well, that's the great thing, too, about, you know, making your own films or writing your own stories is that you really can't focus on all of your favorites. Yeah. And in this one, we got to we got to run the gamut of stories. I mean, we, you know, originally it was going to be focused very much on the Kecksburg crash. And I think at this point, the Kecksburg crash takes up maybe eight minutes of the movie, eight to ten minutes. And then it goes into, you know, a little bit of backstory on Stan and, and his investigations into the strange in in the state of Pennsylvania. And then it delves into the UFO Bigfoot flap that took place near Fayette County and Westmoreland counties in nineteen seventy three and nineteen seventy four. So we got to do we got to do a lot on this one. But my absolute favorite story that's in this movie is is barry like as as far as his the personal involvement that barry had in in investigating and giving up investigating because of his own strange you know whatever whatever happened to him he thinks it might have been like an alien abduction type scenario after he witnessed the object at bell farm that's that's the story that really got me and there there's a lot to barry's story that we had to leave out of the movie he actually had us shut the cameras down and told us additional stories, um, very unsettling kind of stuff after, after his interview was done. So there's, there's a lot to bury that hasn't been told. And, and I'm hoping maybe someday we can get back to his, his own in, encounters and his own experiences. Yeah. Like I said, man, I enjoyed watching him on there. He's such an interesting character and I know he's not, he he's not playing a character. He's playing himself. So it does seem though, too, that like Kecksburg happened in late 65. And then you had eight years later when the, the rash of, of other paranormal activity started with the 
uh, UFO and, and Bigfoot sightings. And, and it seemed like, you know, I guess if you went back to Kecksburg, that that event sort of made it okay for the people in this area to start to talk to each other about these things, right? Yeah, I mean, Eric Altman, who's one of the investigators in the movie, at one point says that Kecksburg was like the, the catalyst for people feeling like it was okay to come forward with their own experiences. And I don't know that it came across in the film as well as I would have liked it to, but it wasn't that like there were these huge inciting events that were taking place along the ridge and they were there were there were decades or whatever years passing between them. There was constantly activity and there has been constantly activity. There's constant activity right now. In fact, Stan, I was just, I had breakfast with Stan in Kentucky a few weeks ago and he told me some, some, one of the weirdest stories involving like a headless Bigfoot type creature that just came into him like a couple of weeks ago with the activity along the ridge is constant. Um, you do have, I picked the stories that appealed to us the most, you know, like this is, this is really dramatic. This is really cool. But especially toward the end, our movie kind of becomes just like a series of bizarre stories happening one after the other. And that's to kind of illustrate the fact that this is a, a constant thing. There's always weird stuff going on there. So, but, but yeah, Kecksburg seems to have been the incident that put it in the public mind that, hey, there is something going on along the ridge. There, there's weird activity here and it's okay if you talk about it to other people and then because of that it, it seems like more pe- more and more people started coming forward definitely and kecksburg has an, an interesting detail to it that's that's in the film but it's not I, I don't know if you know this story about okay so the thing that crashed whether it was a, i mean it, it looked like it was shaped like a bell almost like you know just had that that bell shape right yeah yeah and they they commemorate this they have like a little bell monument out in the, the woods for it yeah, it's right at the top. It's actually like right in the right downtown. Um, it's not in the woods where it crashed. The woods where it crashed is about two, two, three miles, two, two miles probably, like outside of town. But they they actually took the UFO. Uh, they call it the Space Acorn that was built for the Unsolved Mysteries episode about Kecksburg. So that's actually the Unsolved Mysteries uh, Space Acorn, and they put it on a you know, on like a, a little pedestal and it, it sits there in town right near the fire station and you can go have your, your picture taken with it. I think you're going, I think you're planning on talking about probably the, the Nazi bell. No, no, it actually wasn't. Okay. But it, but if you want to, I think it's probably necessary. But my question about that was it had hieroglyphic writing on it. Right, right, yeah. And there's also similar reports from Roswell and from Rendlesham in the UK that include seeing hieroglyphs on these these crashed crafts. Do you, and do you I feel any... like Aztec or one of those, one of those like Nevada desert. There's one of those weird UFO crashes out there that had that too. Yeah, it's a, it's a common. It seems to be a common occurrence. What do you make of that exactly? Yeah, I don't, I have, I, I have no idea. I've seen, you know, like I've, I, early on, I was more into ufology or UFOs and flying saucers and that kind of stuff than I was into Bigfoot. And I know I've seen skeptics debunk that thing, that stuff as like uh, weather balloons and, you know, it could be a Russian satellite and all that kind of stuff. But it doesn't seem like when I've heard people talk about the actual hieroglyphs or the writing on, on the object, these were people that were familiar with what Russian letters looked like. And this was not, you know, Russian. It, it didn't look like, you know, some sort of Russian writing on there. I, the, the hieroglyphs, if that's something that is, if those people that claim to have seen that are being honest, I would say that kind of shoots down, obviously the meteor theory, but it might point more toward the satellite explanation for what fell. And I, I don't know where Stan comes down on this subject right now. I know at one point he was falling fairly firmly into the, the fallen uh, satellite camp, but I don't think he's in that camp anymore. I don't know where his, where he leans on this personally. I, I think, you know, it was probably some sort of Russian satellite. That's my own personal theory. Well, let's talk about the Nazi bell just for a moment. Then do you think Mm -hmm. that it's similar to that? Uh, no, I don't. I, I I never bought the the bell thing. It it definitely. I I can see why people say that, but I think it's a stretch to connect the two. You know, at the same time, Warner von Brahms in America at that time. So who knows? Maybe it was like maybe he he was playing around with the you know the design of the Nazi bell and and 
came up with his own Americanized version of it, and that's what fell there. But again, that that doesn't explain the the weird lettering along the base and that kind of stuff. No, I I don't personally buy the Nazi bell idea. I love not you got to be word this right without you know sounding like a psychopath. I love the idea that there's like this this is some sort of secret you know conspiracy or something by the Nazis, but I don't think I don't think that's I don't think that's the case at all. This is what I love about these mysteries so much is is that the the actual story implications for what you can come up come up with like if you were telling a fictionalized version of the Kexberg story would be phenomenal. Like and this is fodder for story arcs worth of comic books. I mean and and someday I hope to do something like that. I've I've had I'm a huge comic book fan, and I think stories like this have always like really inspired my my creative gene when it comes to to telling comic book stories about ufology. I think there's there's a lot to be mined here that hasn't been done yet. Well, yeah, I think that'd be a fucking great idea to be honest, especially with the Universal is is creating their monster universe right on on film here. In the next few mm-hmm. years, they're going to really flesh that out. And man, a small town monsters kind of shared universe in comics would be i think would be really cool yeah we're, ta- we're uh, yeah we're talking about it it's, <laughs> it's actually it's actually kind of in the works and we've got some pretty pretty huge names that we've discussed this with so it's I, and again like all of this comes down to time um because i'm a huge comic book fan so if we're doing anything with comic books i've got to be involved because i've been into comics for for decades probably longer than i've been into bigfoot and and, you know ufos and this kind of stuff but yeah there's a lot of opportunities here because of the fact that i i am a comic book fan i hosted a comic book podcast for a long time so we have some decent connections but that is something at some point we will probably do Man, that would be cool, and I'd love to. Yeah, I'd love to read it and talk about that with you too, because I've also been into comics for quite a while, so we're on the same page there. Transitioning a little bit away from Chestnut Ridge, I, I do want to talk about Mothman because I just have to. It's Halloween, mm-hmm. and we need to talk about Mothman, right? So this does sort of tie back into what you were just saying about you know how there's just such great material here to to fictionalize and to speculate with. So. In the Mothman story, you know, you have this TNT facility where this whole thing sort of took shape, right? Mm-hmm. And it was a uh, munitions factory during World War II, and then it became a, a chemical dumping site. And then it mm-hmm. was like a, a wildlife reserve, sort of. So mm-hmm. is it possible that the chemicals could have altered the DNA of certain animals in the area? You know, some sort of toxic avenger type of thing going on. I, I talked to a lady at Stark County's park system who's a biologist about this because I was like, is there is is this something that could even feasibly happen? She did not pers- personally believe it was likely, like a likely scenario at all. And in fact, there's no real precedence for that type of thing taking place in nature where 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 toxic you know dumping or pollution or whatever caused a creature to morph in the uh, to the capacity that would need to take place for that to be like a likely, you know, explanation for what happened in Point Pleasant. But it's it's a favorite theory of of many people that have looked into the subject as well. But I, you know, I personally don't subscribe to it. I don't know what I subscribe to <laughs> when it comes when it comes to the <laughs> Mothman story. I thought. I believe there could have been some sort of shady like government experiment going on on on, you know, when I say experiment, I mean more like a psychological experiment on the residents of Point Pleasant or something like that. Or, but I don't know. I have I've, I haven't been able to, to come up with a theory that made any sense. But it's I, I just know that when we started looking into this, I honestly I was probably being such a prick because I remember thinking it was an owl. They misidentified an owl, blah, 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 owl. We constantly were saying the word owl during the first few weeks of filming this movie. And the more people we talked to, I was like, well, there's no there. The sightings of the creature don't even they're not even seeing the same thing in a lot of cases. You know, so why why whatever whatever was encountered in by Bob Bosworth in the North Power plant was not an owl. You know, they saw it walking toward them that night. So either Bob is straight up lying, which I don't think he was, or they encountered something that is not an owl, you know, and it's not the same thing. It doesn't sound necessarily like the same thing that was seen by, 
by Linda Scarberry definitely wasn't the same thing that was seen by Lawrence Gray in his bedroom. You know, there could be multiple explanations for what happened in Point Pleasant in 66 uh, relating to the Mothman story, but, you know, or, or the Mothman sightings, but it doesn't explain whatever you come up with. It's not going to explain away stuff like the Men in Black and the the other things that were going on around the area at that time. And by the way, like those those UFO flaps and all that stuff that was going on there, that that was statewide because we were in Flatwoods, which is smack dab in the middle of West Virginia state. It's in the middle. It's the geographical center of West Virginia. And I was told by people there that UFOs were being seen all over the place from like 1965 through the early 70s. So those UFO waves that were being, you know, seen around uh, Point Pleasant and Charleston, that stretched over the whole state. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, Lawrence Gray. I... I need you to tell people his story if they haven't heard it. Just give us like a Cliff Notes version of it because I, I have a question about that that ties into what we're talking about. Yeah, and I'll, I'll actually tell you a little bit more about it because we left some of it out just for time's sake. But Lawrence is a, a Point Pleasant resident who came home from church one night in 1966. His story, the way he told it to us, and, and it, some of this was left out of in the film, is that they came home from church one night. When they got there, the back door to their house was open, which is unusual. They came into the house, and he said there was just a weird feeling in the house, like you felt like someone was there. He went throughout the entire house, and I believe he either had a, had a lead pipe or a baseball bat because he thought he was going to encounter someone that you know that had broken into the house. But there was no one in in the house. He went through the entire house, all the you know, every closet, everything. And they go to him and his wife go to bed that night. And around 2 a.m., I want to say somewhere in there, he wakes up and he's laying in bed looking out the window. And um, he turns over. And when he turns over there at the foot of his bed is, is standing what he describes as the Mothman. He also describes it as the devil. The, whoever it was, they were standing at the foot of his bed. And he started he started saying the name of Jesus or, or something like that. And when that happened, he said that the the figure disappeared like when you put salt on a slug. Yeah. You know, like it yeah. just kind of morphed out of existence or something. Yeah. Um, he said he so, he said he focused on something. I don't remember exactly what he said, but he focused on something and then the, the figure began to like dissipate right in front of him. Yeah. And my question is does that lend itself to the idea that, that these sorts of phenomena could be mental creations, you know, like a tulpa? Yeah, so for Lawrence, that's what I was saying. Like, what, whatever Lawrence encountered that night doesn't sound at all like what the Scarberries and the Mallet saw. You know, like, he's, he describes a very man-like being in his room. You know, it's it's it doesn't necessarily... He said he did see wings or something, but it had a head on, on its body, you know, and it wasn't, it wasn't shaped like what the Scarberries and Mallets saw. So obviously it, it might lend itself to something like a Talpa or, you know, it could also lend itself to the fact that maybe his consciousness was so aware of what was going on, or maybe even his, he had subconscious. I, in fact, I think it had, to, it would have had to have been a subconscious thing because he told us he wasn't really aware of the Mothman. So subconsciously, maybe he was aware of the Mothman and, and, and had some sort of night terror. Because I have night terrors, I've had them before, and, and I mean, they do seem very real. But I can tell you, whatever happened to him that night, it, it affects him as strongly now as it did in 1966. And I think you can kind of tell in the film, I mean, he was shaking when he was telling us the story. It was the most intense, up until we interviewed Barry, it was the most intense interview we'd ever been a part of. He was, you know, he's almost in tears. He was shaking the entire time. His hands were shaking like crazy. He had a powerful screen presence. I don't know if that's what you were going for, but he definitely gave it to you. He has an amazing voice. He has a very strong, like, he's got this, like, there's something about his voice that's really, really powerful. And the way he told the story is really powerful. Yeah, definitely. So let's take tulpas out of it then. You know, these these creatures that people are seeing that, that you focus on, most of them are considered humanoids, you know, because they're upright, they're bipedal. What are the odds, you think, that these creatures are related to human beings could they be ancestors of ours giants you know people from the inner earth ghost spirits what do you think 
are we talking about Mothman specifically, or, or I think I was trying to sort of encompass the ones. That, yeah, just you know, because Mothman looks like a human from from the reports. Then you have Bigfoot sightings. You know, obviously it's an upright bipedal creature that could be a hairy human. I don't know. I mean, sure, sure, yeah. It it just depends on your own personal opinions i think based on your research into this like personally when it comes to bigfoot i'm boring i subscribe to the fact that it's more than likely an undiscovered primate and i base that on the fact that the sightings the bulk of the sightings are of a creature that acts very much like a you know like an ape like an undiscovered ape behaviorally that's what i see i don't see a lot of crossover between bigfoot sightings and sightings of paranormal experiences or paranormal creatures like the mothman there there obviously are things that do seem to tie the two together but i don't necessarily think that bigfoots are coming out of ufos and that kind of stuff that isn't to say i don't think that sightings like what kowalczyk witnessed that night didn't happen i just don't necessarily think what he saw is the same thing you know that that a typical bigfoot witness is describing so any any number of theories would probably draw my attention as well as you know any other number of theories i'm i'm a obviously when it comes to bigfoot if i remove bigfoot from the equation then it opens me up a little bit more to talk about you know obviously it could be it could be something you know, hallucinatory something where the government's experimenting on people and there's hallucinatory something in the water supply or or in the case of the flatwoods monster it could have been a you know some sort of government military object that was in the woods that night when we get into mothman i've got a few different theories but none of them really hold up you know when you when you really weigh them against the bulk of the eyewitness reports and when you start to encompass all the the other stuff the the ufo sightings and the men in black it kind of falls apart there too i mean i in invasion on chestnut ridge we talked about it the more you look into it the less the less you know the more questions you have so obviously i there's a lot of directions you can go and it's fun to to play that it's fun to play that game you know to to, my dad and i were doing it yesterday for because we were in the car for 11 hours because we drove five and a half hours to to west virginia to shoot an interview and five and a half hours back but at the end of the day it's all it's all speculation and i don't know the the thing about it that's interesting to me is i don't know that we'll ever have the answers yeah and you know what i don't really know if we want the answers because i just think it's more interesting not having them right Right. You know, I, I, and, and the speculation on that, that is part of the fun, like trying, trying to figure out the, the mystery or, or weighing the odds, you know, not weighing the odds, but weighing the, the different elements of all these mysteries is part of the, part of the draw of the subject for me. But also the truth could be absolutely horrifying, you know, like in a completely different way, something that we don't even understand. I mean, right. if, you, if you think of the fact that if you, if you subscribe to the, the idea that maybe this, thing in point plus it was some sort of government experiment it, it means that the government was willing to experiment on citizens of a small town you know which in itself is terrifying and the government's terrifying anyway but you know if, if we were discovered that is 100 percent true with point pleasant it might you know might absolutely terrify you the rest of your life to trust anyone let alone your government which you can't trust anyway 100 percent agree on that man so yeah have you found anything in common with these locations? You know, you've been to, to several now for your films, and I'm sure you've been to many more, you know, scouting or just for fun. But it does seem like there is maybe some commonality, but I'm curious what you see there. You know, are there government facilities nearby? Is the terrain similar? Are there ley lines running through some of these? You know, like what's your take on what these areas may have in common? I, I honestly haven't spent a ton of time looking into how they're connected. I, I did notice something weird and it's probably just a weird synchronicity but with like minerva monster i traced the lincoln highway and it actually ran through three of the places where our movie takes place um wow. yeah and i thought that was kind of cool but i mean that's just a, probably more than likely just a coincidence or a synchronicity or however you want to say it but you know i mean they're just i i honestly can't connect falc to whitehall or falc to point pleasant other than to say they're all rural areas with 
people, you know, good people. That's the strange thing about these these sightings is every single sighting or, or major incident, the inciting incident, the inciting, you know, the the initial encounter that kind of blows everything up into a huge small town monster case is almost always that the the family or the initial witnesses are believable people. They're not people who would necessarily be making this up. I mean, a perfect example is like the, the Sutton family, you know, with the Hopkinsville goblin story, you know, that story revolves around, yeah, there's like some shady characters that were involved in it. I think Billy Ray was like a a corny and stuff like that, but like the, his, his, the mom in the family is a totally believable witness. Uh, the Caton family in the Minerva Monster case, they didn't want any attention from this. And that's something that runs across a lot of these cases. The, the witness don't want anything to do with it. You know, so it's not like these the inciting incident is taking place with, you know, a, a group of, of folks who, who are on TV that same night, you know, and, and are writing books about it a day later and making thousands of dollars off of it. Then I mean, for the most part, these people don't want anything to do with, it, you know, but as far as like a, a theory for what, what connects all these locations together, I don't see anything necessarily that connects the, the towns together or the locations of these sightings. I've heard the ley lines thing before, but I don't, I've never taken the time to see if in the case of what we've done so far, if that holds any water. How about like ancient cultures, you know, like, like, for example, the Ohio Valley area is, is steep in ancient folklore. And then you go to the, the serpent mounds, you know, like, for example, could these just be remnants of a previous era of human existence? It's possible. The, the Native American thing's fascinating because of the fact that it is, that actually is probably a commonality that all, all these locations share. Because I know in the in the case of Whitehall, New York, there's Algonquin and Iroquois Indians that were in the area at the time. In the case of Minerva Monster, now this is the problem is some of this stuff you you run the risk of uh, you run the risk of turning it into folklore. Because in the I know in the case of the Minerva Monster, what I've been told is that the hill behind their house is on an old Indian burial ground, which sounds silly, but that is what I've been told. And the Catons actually claimed to have encountered a lady like a native american woman on horseback on the on the hill they also claimed to have heard dis, disembodied chanting almost sounding like it's coming from within the hill itself in the case of falk i'm not 100 percent sure you know if, if there were were native americans in that area or first nations people in the area at the time but i do know that you know, obviously in the case of point pleasant you've got uh corn stalk um and while i don't buy into the corn Cornstall curse. Certainly, there were native tribes that were running run out of you know the Point Pleasant and surrounding area during that time who would have a reason to be angry about it. And then in the case of invasion on Chestnut Ridge, I'm not sure, or, or in Flatwoods either. I haven't you know I haven't looked into native tribes that would have been in the area. But it, what would be interesting to see is how those tribes what their what their legends revolve around or their lore or, or their belief system revolved around and if if there's any kind of uniting factor between those things obviously the the Iroquois and the Algonquin have the stories of the rock giants and all that kind of stuff but I don't know you know I, I don't know I don't know how that stuff connects to where where the locations are where they were well, I think if you wanted to get literal i mean this whole country is a native american burial ground so, yeah yeah exactly uh, sure yeah this the whole place seems to be haunted i guess it's kind of idiotic for me to say that is a uniting factor between those locations actually because they were here long before we were so obviously anywhere you go is is probably going to have a a rich history of native lore Hey, I was wondering if you had been following the recent uh, owlman sightings in chicago just what Lon Strickler sends me occasionally, like he'll send me reports as they come in, but I haven't, I haven't had as much time as I'd like to, to look into this stuff. I mean, right now we're in the process of finishing filming. We're finishing actual filming on uh, Flatwoods, but we're also doing pre-pro on Bray Road Beast and I'm doing um, the editing of the Case Files episodes. So the, the amount of time I have to actually devote to like looking into sightings and stuff has gone way down. Having said that, I did get to go. I went to the Big Sky Bigfoot conference out in Montana. That kind of like reignited my interest in Bigfoot. So that was kind of cool. Like that's something I've discovered is just like my my own personal interest in the subjects kind of wanes at time, you know, because you're so 
you're so involved in one particular story. That's all you really think about for a while. So your interest in other things might go away while you're working on one thing. So sometimes it's nice. Like I went to the big sky and, uh, you know, I just got to listen to like Jeff Meldrum and Bob Gimlin talk about Bigfoot. And I kind of reignited my, my love for, for that subject a little bit. And it, the same thing happened at the Mothman festival. You know, I, I got to listen to some of those guys talk about, you know, strange cases and it, it gets, it kind of reignites. It, I guess it reminds you of why you're doing this to begin with. You know, I didn't get into this because I wanted to make movies for a living or whatever. I got into, I was into this and I did a, you know, the Sasquatch podcast because I love the subjects. Yeah, man, it, it's hard not to get swept up in them. You know, I've been watching your films all week in preparation for this, and I'm all about small town monsters right now. But next week I'll be about something else. You know, I heard somewhere else that you were fascinated by lake monsters and. Obviously, uh, the Loch Ness Monster is the most famous lake monster in the world, but what are some other lake monster stories you enjoy, and would there be a specific one that you'd like to make a film about? Yeah, we're producing the On the Trail of Champ, which is going to be like the miniseries from Small Town Monsters about the Champ Lake Monster, and it's directed by Alexander Petikoff, and that'll be, be out next year. But like, Champ's one of my favorites, but my absolute favorite, I think, is is probably like Ogopogo. I'm a huge Ogopogo fan. And um, I just learned about one while I was in Montana, the Flatheads, uh, Flatheads Lake Monster, Flathead Lake Monster. Lake Erie right above us has its own, which I think is called Bessie. Um, it's got a few different names. Those are probably my my favorites. I'm, I obviously like the, the Loch Ness story, but I don't necessarily subscribe to it or think that there's anything there anymore. But Champ to me is the most believable because of how huge the lake is and the fact that it, you know, it's it's got it possibly could connect to the ocean and things like that. There's just there's things about that story that make me think that that there could be something to it. Whether or not it's actually a plesiosaur, I don't know, but the, I think Champ is is definitely the most believable. But my favorite's Ogopogo. Is Champ the one that that runs into the U.S. and Canada? It's possible. I'm trying to think. It starts in New York and then runs. It actually starts right near Whitehall, um, and then runs all the way up into Vermont. It's possible it runs up that far. I can't remember. I just was looking at a map of it. Yeah, I for some reason thought that I that it ran into Canada somewhere, but I could be mistaken. But the Ogopogo one. Tell people a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Uh, it's like this sea serpent that looks kind of like a, 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 almost like a dragon. And it's on a lake called Lake, oh God, it's like Lake o- Okanagan, I, bl- I want to say. I think it's Okanagan. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Okan- you can tell I'm an expert on, on this, but it's, yeah, it's like a, it's like a sea serpent. It's basically, it looks like a, almost like one of those, you know, like a dragon, like a Chinese dragon. And I've always just loved the design quote-unquote design of the creature so much and at the same time i'm absolutely terrified of snakes so the it's also the scariest to me but it's 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 a really cool design and i think the the look of it and some of the background stories on it are so cool so i'm hoping at some point we can do something on that yeah i mean that would definitely be pretty cool i i've not really gotten into lake monsters much i'm only familiar with like the major ones which you know, like aside from Loch Ness, it's just really, I think, the ones that we've been talking about, to be honest. I'm, I'm not sure about the Montana one that you mentioned, though. What was that one again? The Flathead Lake Monster. It's, um, it's I don't know much about it other than a couple of the stories I was told while I was there. But it's in a, a lake in the northern, I, th- I want to say the northern part of Montana. Which, we, we got to make a movie there at some point, because I, I was just there, and the, the scenery there is terrific. It's kind of one of those places where you would expect a lot more of this activity to take place, but since there's not many people, you probably don't hear as much, right? Right. Yeah. But supposedly, I I think that one's supposed to have decades though of of really cool, you know, stories. It's just that it's also much less known because of the fact that it is in a a more isolated part of the state. There's only like a million people that live in the entire state. So if you're, if you're antisocial, like I am, it's, it's the place to go. (laughs) If you want to go monster hunt, it's the best place to go. Yeah, definitely. So last question for you, then, man, you've definitely covered some of the major small town monster stories with your work to this point. What are some lesser known or maybe under the radar stories you've heard from small towns that you think deserve more attention and would be worth making a film about in the future? I mean, that River Sticks monster story is really cool. 
and that's a local story. And I doubt it's one we'd ever get to do because a lot of the witnesses are dead. But it, it what's what's really cool about that story to me is actually tracking the fall off of sightings to when the area started becoming more and more developed. So you add all these sightings in the 70s and 80s and even into the early 2000s of the River Sticks monster. But in the early 2000s, the area out there started getting heavily developed. And as soon as that happened, the sighting stopped. I mean, like, like stopped, like there, there were regular s- stories coming in and then it's all over. Um, and today that area is so populated, you know, there's houses everywhere and the sighting stopped. But I'd love to do something about that at some point. And maybe I can get like a case files episode or something about it. But beyond that, outside of the, state of ohio i'm trying to think because we have a whole list somewhere in fact we're we're planned out through 2020 i'll I'll tell you some of the top ones that we're going to get to we're going to get to lizard man at some point we want to get to the bell witch enfield horror momo flatwoods monster obviously beast of bray road was on the list you know the uh, the ohio grass man but not in that context i don't i don't buy um, the Ohio Grassman uh, moniker at all. I don't think it's anything that came around until the 90s. But we're we're going to get to uh, some sort of definitive history of Ohio Bigfoot here at some point because it's my state. You know, it's it's where I live, and I spent a lot of time researching the historical record for those sightings. So at some point, we're going to get to that, and probably sooner than people expect. The cool thing about on the trail of it's going to allow us to delve into those the do like really deep sort of looks at the not just like researching and investigating the the sightings and and encounters with the creatures but also like much more getting into a more of the backstory and the history like i think on the trail of champ is going to spend a lot of time on fleshing out the history of lake champlain and the history of sightings in the area so when you do start to move further into the into the modern era and and alexander's taking you out on the boat with Katie and and Will and Scott Martis, you're aware of why they're going out in the first place. And I would love to do something like that uh, here in Ohio with with Ohio Bigfoot stories. And Ohio's got a lot of its own small town monster stories, you know. So even that I grew up in a town called Bolivar, but right near us was a, a tiny little stop called Mineral City. And they had Minnie the Monster, which was this monster that lived up in an abandoned train tunnel. And it was supposedly kids with park up by the train tunnel and neck and if you did that the monster would come running out of that tunnel and and run your car off you know like every town's got their monster i think so there's a lot there's like an endless well for us to draw off of have you ever thought about making you know fictionalized versions of like feature films like some like a really cool you know spielberg-esque approach to like a 70s horror film yeah i'm doing i'm doing something on wednesday of this week in that in that realm with a, a short project. And that'll be like the way I test the waters on whether or not I'm any good working in a fictional fictional way. But yeah, it's something we're talking about. STM is a production company. There's a series called Small Town Monsters, obviously, but Small Town Monsters also operates as a production company. So there's other projects that are going to start getting announced over the next year that are not directly related to me, you know, like making them. And um, some of that is going to be opening the door to working on, on fictional projects for us down the road, hopefully in a, in a huge mega budget, you know, (laughs) and when I say mega budget, I mean probably minuscule budget compared to most other independent films, but mega for us, (laughs) um, you know, in a way that we can, so we can actually afford to do some of the, the ideas we've had for fictional stories. Yeah, I would love to see a, a return, you know, to classic monster horror. You know, like I mentioned, the universal approach to their shared monster universe that's coming up here. But even beyond that, you know, just to see more of a an independent return to those kind of feature fictional films, I think would be really cool. Yeah. So do you have a favorite horror film? Jeez, it depends on what we're defining as horror films, because my mom raised me on like Hammer, like Hammer movies. Oh, yeah. And um, her favorite actor was Christopher Lee. So I grew up watching Christopher Lee's Dracula movies. And then, you know, I, I probably would say my favorite horror movie is The Invisible Man with Claude Rains. But I don't know. I don't know that people are going to consider that horror. So it's it's either that or if you, if that's not horror enough, it's probably The Shining. I mean, I watch The Shining like once a year. 
and it's the movie I go back to the most. But I, I adore the Universal Monster movies and anything from Hammer, uh, stuff like that. You know, like, and I grew up, I grew up watching The Evil Dead too. My brother and I were huge Bruce Campbell fans, so that's probably somewhere in there as well. I love Bruce Campbell. I love those early Sam Raimi films. They just like he just such has has a, a cool style and approach to mm-hmm. it, and definitely right there with you with the uh, the monster films from Universal as well. So. Uh, Seth Breedlove, hey man, uh, thanks for being here. Please do tell people where they can find your work. Yeah, um, smalltownmonsters.com is like where you can get all the updates and stuff. And uh, facebook.com slash smalltownmonsters. It might be SML Town Monsters, I can't remember. But those are the two best places to kind of keep track of us. Our movies are all available through Amazon and uh, Vimeo On Demand and hopefully other avenues soon. Awesome, man. Well, hey, thanks so much for the time again. I know you're a busy dude. I really do appreciate it, and I admire and respect your work, and uh, good luck with the rest of it, man. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me on, dude. (laughs) And there you have it. My thanks again to Seth Breedlove. Check out smalltownmonsters.com for more about his work. I've also included a link in the show notes to his latest film, Invasion on Chestnut Ridge, on Amazon, where you can buy or rent it right now. You know, last year's Trapper Treat was the inaugural version of this, and it was just one episode, but I started it with a true ghost story from my life that I experienced because we had the paranormal podfather Jim Harold in the house then, so it was quite fitting to tell a true ghost story. And in honor of Seth Breedlove's appearance here, I think it's fitting to end this year's Trapper Treat with a true monster story from my life. So a few years ago, I was in a relationship with a girl who had family in Mexico, and we went to visit them. It was late August. We were camping on a small private beach in the Baja. No electricity, no cell signal. It was bliss. And one night, a few of us are out fishing, and we... Oh, little Dorothy, are you still telling this silly chupacabra story? What? What's... What's wrong with the chupacabra story? (laughs) You are the chupacabra. Have you not learned anything since we met? Honestly, I feel like I don't know anything anymore. Good. Clearly the light has illuminated you. Well, why are you still here then? I am always here. Hmm. You'll always be here, won't you? (laughs) I have to be. Without me, you are not whole. You are stuck with me. (laughs) So what do we do now? There's only one thing left to do. What's that? We dance. a little bit of fun now, I'll make one check out of two now, and it's a little bit funny when I'm wrong now, but everybody's talking about the breakdown, so I break these records into pieces and fix them together just how I need them, play it in a club at 12 o'clock, then what can I say, funny now, Something strange in your neighborhood, who you gonna call, Ghostbusters, something weird, and it don't look good, who you gonna call,
little bit of fun now. I make one check out of two now. And it's a little bit funny when I'm wrong now. But everybody's talking about the breakdown. So I break these records into pieces and fix them together just how I need them. Play it in a club at 12 o'clock. Then what can I say? Funny not please. You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.